Uh, welcome to the discussion of microbiology questions that were asked in JIPMER postgraduate medical entrance exam in the year 2019, the May exam. So our first question was, all of the following are true about listeria except acquired by raw milk causes granulomatous infantiseptica can cause abortions in second trimester of pregnancy and gram-negative bacteria. So it's very easy question that the answer to this is that Listeria is not a gram-negative but it's a gram-positive bacterium and it is a gram-positive bacillus. So let's quickly go through some important points that we need to remember about Listeria. So Listeria, the species that is pathogenic to humans is monocytogenes. The most common cause of human disease are the serotypes 4b, 1 oblique 2a and 1 oblique 2b. These are the commonest serotypes responsible for human infection or human disease. So Listeria monocytogenes is a gram-positive rod or a bacillus which is a unique bacterium which is peritrichus. It forms peritrichus flagellae only at room temperature that is 25 to 28 degrees celsius but not at 37 degrees celsius so this is a bacterium which is motile at room temperature non-motile at 37 then it has tumbling motility or also called as end on end motility then we can use cold enrichment to isolate listeria from a group of bacteria because Listeria can grow at wide temperature ranges starting from 4 degrees Celsius to 45 degrees Celsius. So since the temperature in a refrigerator is somewhere is around 4 degrees Celsius, if we want to isolate Listeria from a mixture of bacteria, we can refrigerate the culture plate instead of incubating at 37. So Listeria will be still able to grow and the rest of the bacteria will not be able to grow. So this process of separating out or isolating Listeria from a mixture of bacteria by incubating in the refrigerator is called as cold enrichment. And also remember, we can use cold enrichment also for Yersinia. Another important character of Listeria monocytogenes is it gives the CAMP test positive that is, enhanced zones of hemolysis are produced when we streak inoculate colonies of Listeria perpendicular to the inoculation of Staph aureus. Right? So we get the, the, the hemolysins of both these bacteria, Staph aureus and Listeria. They synergize to produce enhanced zones of hemolysis. Next is, it gives the Antons test positive, which is similar to the Sereni test that we do for Shigella or enteroinvasive E. coli that is keratoconjunctivitis seen in a guinea pig or eye or rabbit. Next when we grow it on blood agar listeria is beta hemolytic and the selective medium that is used for isolating it is the pal cam agar. Right so very important to remember cold enrichment, tumbling motility, camp and antens test positive and the Palcam agar is the selective medium. Now, Listeria is present as a normal saprophyte in soil, decaying vegetation, as well as in water. And it can be present as a normal gut flora in several mammals, including humans. So, it can be present as a normal flora in the feces in about 5 to 10 percent of healthy humans. Now, mode of infection for Listeria is ingestion and Generally, there is a history of ingestion of unpasteurized milk or milk products which are like cheese, especially feta cheese or there might be a mention of say pizzas. Now, um, so since pizzas also contain cheese, so ingestion of such raw milk or cheeses prepared by using this unpasteurized milk or ingestion of unwashed raw vegetables or salads or sometimes by ingestion of meats which may be processed meats or fresh meats especially the word refrigerated food is often mentioned in the questions right so because it can grow at fridge temperatures 
so that's our mode of infection ingestion and generally it is an asymptomatic infection as i mentioned earlier can be present as a normal flora but sometimes it can cause gastroenteritis or it can cause bacteremia which can rarely be complicated by endocarditis and meningitis especially in immunodeficient and in elderly after streptococcus pneumoniae it is the second most common cause of meningitis in elderly as well as immunodeficient of course i mean non hiv in hiv the commonest cause of meningitis is cryptococcus pneumoniae right so this is in uh, non pregnant adults coming to pregnant females in pregnancy there is a 17 fold 17 to sometimes even up to 100 fold risk of bacteremia and then listeria has an affinity for the placenta and then it causes chorioamnionitis this chorioamnionitis can lead to stillbirths premature labor spontaneous abortions and neonatal death so spontaneous abortions was mentioned in the question it can lead to abortions in second trimester or pregnancy it can cause abortions at any time can cause premature labor stillbirth etc and sometimes the child may survive but can develop a very severe disease which is called as granulomatous infanticeptica characterized by multiple visceral abscesses as well as skin pustules then also a uh, perinatal transmission or sometimes transmission in utero can lead to neonatal septicemias as well as neonatal meningitis so uh, classified as early onset and late onset early onset would be due to in utero infection and late onset would be due to a perinatal transmission drug of choice for treatment of listeria infections is ampicillin and in penicillin allergic patients we can give cotrimoxazole move on to our next question auto infection is not seen in which of the following so auto infection not seen options hymenolepis nana hymenolepis diminuta strongyloides tercoralis tinea solium the answer to this question is hymenolepis diminuta which is also called as rat tape form right so generally hymenolepis diminuta the life cycle runs between the rat which is the definitive host and the intermediate host are insects right so you can see the life cycle out here rats and sometimes humans become definite hosts so the, this hymenolepis diminuta is present in the intestines as the adult worms so you can see those segmented worms in the small intestines eggs are passed out in feces these are ingested by insects like moths like flies or like fleas etc and in the gi tract of these insects the oncospheres are going to hatch out from those eggs and they will penetrate the intestinal wall and develop into cysticercoid larva which is present in the body cavity and if these in infected insects are ingested either by rats or by humans accidentally these cysticercoid larva will develop into adult hymenolepis nana uh, diminuta in the small intestine right so this is the life cycle there is no auto infection let us contrast it with the other hymenolepis species that is hymenolepis nana in which the auto infection is seen now h nana look and see again the definitive host could be either rats or humans let's concentrate on the left hand side of the life cycle now you can see here that the adult worms are present in the intestines eggs are passed out those are the characteristic eggs you can see those polar filaments can you see those polar filaments between the oncosphere and the shell now these eggs are ingested by a, by the insects and these intercysticercoid larva will develop this these insects when ingested by either rats or by humans they will be develop into adult hymenolepis nana now coming to 
what is written here what is external auto infection here what we can see is that if these eggs are ingested also by humans they are infective to man so that is external auto infection via contaminated fingers that is that is feces contaminated fingers external auto infection can occur now let's come to the left hand cycle uh, sorry the right hand cycle here these this is internal auto infection when the adult h nana are present these eggs in which are laid in the gi tract sometimes hatch immediately the oncosphere gets released the cyst at uh, this oncosphere hatches and cysticercoid larva develops and this develops or penetrates the intestinal villus and it develops out there and develops into the adult h nana so this is internal auto infection that is the eggs are hatching out within the gi tract so both external and internal auto infection is possible in h nana so h nana also called as a dwarf tapeworm the smallest tapeworm infecting man now now let us remember that what are the important parasites in which external auto infection or rather auto infection is seen we can use this mnemonic chest with double c cryptosporidium parvum capillaria philippensis h nana enterobius vermicularis strongyloides tercoralis and tinea solium so these are the important parasites causing auto infection Our next question is which of the following is not a reservoir host of Japanese encephalitis horse herons egrets and pigs now in this horse is not a reservoir host horse and humans are dead end hosts and why are they called dead end hosts because they develop insufficient viremia so remember in Japanese encephalitis horses as well as humans these are dead end hosts insufficient viremia to transmit the infection back to the mosquito while during a blood meal right herons egrets are aquatic birds and pigs are amplifier so all these are reservoirs so let us see the transmission cycle of japanese encephalitis the natural cycle of japanese encephalitis occurs between the aquatic birds also called as water or rd birds but like i just mentioned herons etc and between the culex right culex tritaneo rhynchus and sometimes also culex vishnoi right and the amplifying cycle occurs in the pigs so many fold replication of the virus occurs in the pigs so pig and culex also the transmission cycle can occur but the natural cycle occurs between the aquatic birds and the mosquitoes and man and horses are dead end hosts so japanese encephalitis belongs to the family of rna viruses that is flavi viridi the vector is culex tritaneo rhynchus and culex vishnoi in india natural reservoirs aquatic birds remember all these names cranes herons egrets and storks and amplifying reservoir host is pigs eosinophils in the csf are present in meningitis due to all except in other words we are being asked all of the following cause eosinophilic meningitis except so parasites when they cause meningitis it's a very rare form of meningitis that is parasitic meningitis Uh, are characterized by the presence of eosinophils in the CSF. So answer to this is Sporothrix shenkai. That's a fungus. It does not cause eosinophilic meningitis. The other three are all nematodes: Angiostrongylus candidensis, Nathostoma, and Bailey's ascaris. Right. So these are causes of eosinophilic meningitis. and most common cause of eosinophilic meningitis is angiostrongylus cantonensis the disease is called as neurologic angiostrongyliasis less common bailis ascaris procyonis which causes bailis ascariasis 
and nathostoma spinigerum causing neuronathostomiasis could remember the commonest causes angiostrongylus let us see the life cycle briefly the life cycle generally of angiostrongylus runs between the rodents which are the definitive hosts so in the definitive host where are the angiostrongylus present in the pulmonary arteries in the pulmonary arteries the first stage larva that is stage l1 larva these are going to be laid down by the uh, adults and these larvae hatch and penetrate the alveolar walls migrate to the pharynx and are swallowed and then are passed out in the feces of the rodents these eggs or rather the l larva stage 1 these when they are ingested either by slugs or by snails these are the intermediate host the larva stage 3 will develop in the slugs or snails now how does man get infected either by ingestion of these slugs or snails which are poorly cooked or sometimes fishes which have ingested these snails they become paratenic host what's a paratenic host that is there is no further development right so it's an accidental host which has with which in which there is no further development of that parasite so these fishes when they are ingested with larva stage 3 or slugs or snails which are uh, poorly cooked containing larva stage 3 or sometimes by salads which are contaminated with the slime of these slugs or snails that's how man gets infected and these angiostrongylus larva stage 3 will penetrate the intestinal wall of humans and travel to the cns and cause eosinophilic meningitis next question is which of the following is a coco bacillus so amongst these burkholderia mali burkholderia pseudomali acinetobacter bomenai and pseudomonas aeruginosa the one which is a coco bacillus is acinetobacter right so the important coco bacilli which cause human disease are all of them gram negative all coco bacilli also called as pleomorphic bacilli are gram negatives and these include brucella bordetella hemophilus and acinetobacter chlamydia rickettsia francisella and pasturella and right? you can you can you remember them as pears most common gene responsible for methicillin resistance in staph aureus that's very very easy the commonest gene responsible for mrsa is the mec a gene now let's just understand the basis of this mrsa now as we all know that's a cell wall of the gram of uh, bacteria we can see n acetyl glucosamine n acetyl muramic acid these are the murine monomers the blue structures that you can see are alternating carbohydrates nag and nama these are the murine monomers the blue ones and these are cross linked to each other by the pentapeptides or and the tetrapeptides now this is the you can see this tetrapeptide l alanine ending in d alanine and these are being cross linked to each other by these special enzymes which have been highlighted by the enzymes transpeptidases so what is responsible for the cross linking of the murine monomers are the transpeptidases and these are the ones which are inhibited by the beta lactam antibiotics like penicillin cephalosporins monobactams etc and they the beta lactams will come and bind to the transpeptidases inactivate them and thereby inhibit the cross linking leading to the lysis of the bacterium so hence transpeptidases are also called as penicillin binding proteins in short pbps right so remember these transpeptidases now what is the basis of mrsa is in the staph aureus there is a mobile genetic element called as scc mec standing for staphylococcal chromosomal cassette mec which contains the most important gene the mec a gene now this mec a gene 
it encodes an altered transpeptidase penicillin binding protein 2 is now called as pbp2a it has undergone such a structural change that now it has very low affinity for beta lactams so this pbp 2a continues to cross link the cell wall and hence staph becomes staph aureus becomes resistant to the beta lactam antibiotics that's the basis of mrsa also called as orsa that is oxacillin resistant staph aureus so mec a gene encoding this altered drug target pbp 2a a man got bitten on his leg by a dog that produced a bleeding wound. In the hospital where he's taken for post-exposure prophylaxis, he reports that he had been bitten by a dog and completed a full course of rabies vaccination six months ago. Recommended prophylaxis for this man now is. Now what is important to register? It's a bleeding wound, right? So this is going to come in category three and he has received post exposure prophylaxis in the last six months when he had been bitten by a dog six months ago right so what is the recommended prophylaxis for this man now now what is recommended is option c we will give rabies vaccine on day zero and on day three now let us quickly review the rabies prophylaxis with the help of this chart now let's see the categories of exposure. Category 1 is touching or feeding of animals or animal licks on intact skin. This is category 1 for which no profile access is required. Category 2 is animal nibbling, nibbling of uncovered skin or minor scratches or abrasions without bleeding. Right. So this is category 2. Now there are two situations. In a non-immune, what are we going to see? So follow the arrow, the green arrow, non-immune patient has never received rabies prophylaxis. So what are we going to assess? Whether this is an immunocompetent patient or an immunodeficient patient. If it's an immunocompetent patient, we are giving going to give four doses of rabies vaccine on day zero, day three, day 7 and day 14 right so these are the four doses which are going to be given intramuscularly so 0 3 7 and 14 days in an immunocompetent in an immunocompromise we will give one dose extra of rabies vaccine on day 28 in case of category 2 we never give rabies uh, immunoglobulins right so rig is not indicated in category 2 it is only recommended for category 3 exposure now let us come back to category 2 and follow the arrow the red arrow previously immunized in the last five years right so assess the immunization status whether it is immunocompetent or immunodeficient we are only going to give two doses on day zero and day three of rabies vaccine no rig is recommended right because we know it's a category two exposure so remember if the exposure has occurred the patient has been immunized in the last five years we are only going to give two doses of rabies vaccine on day zero and day three whether immunodeficient or immunocompromised now coming to category three Category 3, when do we say exposure? Single or multiple transdermal bites or scratches. So that means abrasions have been produced. It is and it is a bleeding. Plus or there is contamination of mucous membranes or broken skin with saliva from animal licks. Right. So this is a category 3 exposure. So what are we going to do now? Follow the first let's follow the blue arrow if the patient has been immunized in the last five years we are going to follow the same schedule give two doses of on 03 
on day 0 and day 3. And since the patient has been immunized in the last 5 years, we will not give rabies immunoglobulins. If the patient has ever been exposed to rabies vaccine earlier, never give rabies immunoglobulins again, right? The reason is because the patient has received the rabies vaccine, he's having immunoglobulins in his serum. So, so it is, uh, we do not need to give the immunoglobulins now. Coming to a non-immune patient, a category 3 non-immune patient, we will give vaccination plus we will give rabies immunoglobulins. In case of an immunocompetent patient, we will give four doses, day 0, 3, 7, 14. This is for given, giving IM rabies vaccine. Plus, we will give rabies immunoglobulin as soon as possible after vaccination, but not beyond seven years, seven days of, exp of the exposure, right? And in immunocompromise, we will give again one extra dose on day 28, plus we will give rabies immunoglobulin within seven days of exposure, right? Now, in case, let's come to the last box below in light blue. If any exposure to rabies vaccine, rabies has occurred within the last three months, right? The patient has received PEP in the last three months. We do not need to do anything except wash the skin or the exposed area thoroughly with soap and water right so to review our answer uh, to review our answer to this question post exposure prophylaxis of rabies in already vaccinated first of all of course we will wash the wound with soap and water we will never give rabies immunoglobulin in a patient who has already received vaccination earlier. And if the vaccination has been received in the last five years, we will give two doses for moderate cases, three doses for severe cases on day zero, three and seven, right? This is vaccination in the last five years. If vaccination has occurred in the last beyond five years, then we will give full rabies vaccine that is four doses, 0, 3, 7, and 14. And as mentioned earlier, if the rabies vaccine, if the post-exposure prophylaxis has been received in the last three months, we do not need to do anything except for washing the wound. Next question asks us temperature of incubation for culture and our isolation of hemophilus degree from a specimen. So here we are being asked, how will we isolate Haemophilus degree at what temperature? Now, generally remember, so let's read the options here first, then we'll come to explanation. 4 degrees, 33 degrees, 37 degrees, and 42 degrees. The answer to this is 37 degrees. Now, remember all bacteria, they all pathogenic bacteria are called as mesophiles. What are mesophiles? These are those bacteria which pref or grow between 25 to 30, uh, 40 degrees Celsius. These bacteria are called as mesophiles, 25 to 40 degrees. And for most pathogenic bacteria, the optimum temperature of growth is 35 to 37 degrees Celsius. That is, that's why we, we maintain the incubator in the bacteriology lab at 35 to 37 degrees Celsius, right? So, if you are asked what is the optimum temperature for growth of any pathogenic bacterium, as we have been asked here in for Haemophilus Ducri, what is our answer going to be? 35 to 37 degrees Celsius, but there are two exceptions. Okay, our next question is, which of the following is a bioterrorism agent? isospora, cyclospora, cryptosporidium and microspora and the answer to this question is cryptosporidium. Now the center of disease control in Atlanta has classified all pathogens or their products into three categories depending upon certain like they've taken some to certain criteria. So they have classified them into three categories category A, B and C. So category A bioterrorism agents are those which pose a risk to the national security, 
because these are easily disseminated or transmitted from person to person and they are associated with high mortality rates and they are able to cause public panic and they require special action for public health preparedness right so members of the category a bioterrorism agents are bacillus anthracis botulinum toxin yersinia pestis the smallpox virus that is the variola major virus francisella tularensis and the viral hemorrhagic fevers like ebola marburg lassa fever south american hemorrhagic fevers crimean congo hemorrhagic fevers these are associated with high mortality rates so these come under category a category b bioterrorism agents these are moderately easy to disseminate they are associated with moderate morbidity and low mortality rates and they require specific enhancements of the cdc's diagnostic capacity and they require enhanced disease surveillance so amongst the category b bioterrorism agents we have one of the one we are going through that and present in present times that is the coronavirus that is the sars uh, 2 or the covid 19 virus so which are the other members of category b bioterrorism agents brucella chlamydia cystaceae coxella burnetii rickettsia provazaki the cause of epidemic typhus burkholderia mali and burkholderia pseudomali then we have three toxins the epsilon toxin of clostridium perfringens ricin toxin from ricinus communis and staphylococcal enterotoxin b then we have some viral encephalitis causing agents that is eastern equine western equine encephalitis venezuelan equine encephalitis virus then we have food safety threats and water safety threats amongst the food safety threats we have species of salmonella e coli o157 h7 and shigella amongst the water safety threats we have vibrio cholerae and the answer to our question that was cryptosporidium parvum right so that is category b amongst the category c bioterrorism agents we have emerging pathogens which can be engineered for mass dissemination in future because of their ease of availability as well as dissemination potential for high morbidity and mortality rates and they can have a major health impact because of their high mortality and morbidity rates and amongst them we have nipa virus and hanta viruses so remember amongst we read so many bio, uh, bioterrorism agents the only uh, parasite which was present amongst the three categories was cryptosporidium parvum that was the answer to our question pantan valentine leucocidin is produced by which of the following pvl or pantan valentine leucocidin is produced by the answer to this question is methicillin resistant staph aureus to be more specific we have two types of mrsa hospital associated and community acquired the pantan valentine leucocidin is having a special association meaning 100 almost 100% of strains of community acquired mrsa are producing this pvl toxin the lx gel precipitation test is done for which of the following corini bacterium diphtheriae bacillus anthracis clostridium perfringens and streptococcus pyogenes that is the answer to this question is corini bacterium diphtheriae so very important to remember that the toxigenicity tests for corini bacterium diphtheriae which proves that it is producing the diphtheria toxin is this test lx gel precipitation test so here what we have done is we have taken a serum containing medium and at the moment we pour this medium into the petri plate before the medium solidifies we are going to place a filter paper strip which is impregnated with anti diphtheria toxin so when the medium solidifies the filter paper strip goes into the depths of the medium 
Now at right angles we are going to streak the colonies of the test isolate of Corynebacterium diphtheriae that we have isolated from the patient's specimen and incubate this plate. Now the diphtheria toxin will be secreted into the medium. It will move through, diffuse through the medium and the antitoxin where we have impregnated in, in the filter paper will also diffuse through the medium and where both toxin and antitoxin are going to meet, they will form lines of precipitate. So you can appreciate those V's, those are the lines of precipitate formed. This is the LX gel precipitation test, double diffusion in two dimensions test. Which of the following species of Candida is usually not resistant to fluconazole? So Candida glabrata, albicans, cruzii and tropicalis. The answer to this question is Candida albicans. Now uh, by mistake I have put the species, the option D as wrong. This should be Candida auris. The option that was mentioned the question was Candida auris. Now remember there are three species of Candida which have an inherent resistant to fluconazole. Candida glabrata, Candida cruzii and Candida auris. A-U-R-I-S. Gold standard for diagnosis of Zika virus is amongst these the answer is RT-PCR. Right? So that is our gold standard for diagnosis. Now suppose you get the question as gold standard for diagnosis of Zika in the first week of disease, then our answer is going to remain the same, RT-PCR. But suppose you get the question as gold standard for diagnosis of Zika virus in the second week. At that time, the levels of viremia become lower. So in that case, you can in that case, your answer is going to change as, right? So here on the answer remains RT-PCR. Now let's go through some important points about the Zika virus. Reservoir for Zika is monkeys. The vector is AD species like Aedes aegypti, Aedes albopinctus. Apart from being transmitted by the bite of the mosquito, it can also be transmitted transplacently as well as sexually and transmission or rather transfusion of blood and its products as well as organ transplantation right so those are all the modes of its transmission and what does it present as as shown in the figure with headache fever arthralgias myalgias and a maculopapular rash and conjunctival suffusion right Mostly the symptoms, uh, it is an asymptomatic infection, but when it presents, it presents like with these symptoms. Now, what is most important to remember about Zika is that a transmission uh, infection in pregnancy can lead to, in about 5 to 10 percent of fetuses, congenital Zika syndrome, which is characterized by microcephaly, CNS defects like seizures as well as mental retardation, deafness, uh, problems in the eyes like pigmentary uh, retinopathy, congenital glaucoma, then the, patient, the child has limb contractures, limb contractures as well as hypertonia. So microcephaly, very important to remember, as well as limb contractures and hypertonia. Prophylactic management of a man bitten by a macaque monkey. Option in this which is correct is, so let's read the options first, amoxicillin alone. So this is a bite by a macaque monkey. Amoxicillin with anti-rabies vaccine, amoxiclav with anti-rabies vaccine with acyclovir, clindamycin with anti-rabies vaccine. The answer to this question is option C. We will give amoxiclav with anti-rabies vaccine with acyclovir. So whenever we get a monkey bite, so whenever we get a monkey bite by a macaque monkey, what we do is basically 
we are going to uh, give anti rabies vaccine of course that i have already explained we talked about it recent in the previous questions then we will wash the wound nicely with soap and water plus we will give antimicrobial therapy so uh, prophylactic antimicrobial therapy because that uh, bite is going to inoculate several bacteria which are present as normal oral flora so the best or rather the drug of choice for prophylaxis for wound infections is going to be amoxicillin with clavulanic acid and in case a patient is allergic to penicillin the alternative drugs are either metronidazole moxifloxacin or doxycycline right so here our answer was amoxiclav that was written amongst the options along with anti rabies vaccine plus what are we also going to give acyclovir prophylaxis why because we want to give prophylaxis for herpes b virus that is herpes simiae virus which is endemic in old world mon macaque monkeys like rhesus cynomolgus monkeys and pig tailed macaques right now this herpes so by the bite it can be inoculated or by scratches from these monkeys or by contamination of wounds with macaque saliva laceration from bottles containing macaque cell cultures so while doing laboratory work or aerosols of oral genital or ocular secretions of these macaque monkeys or scratches from the cages which are uh, of these monkeys this is how all the modes of transmission from the these monkeys to humans now for this preventing this herpes uh, simi infection we are going to give this patient either acyclovir or val acyclovir prophylaxis thank you